After more than a half century, the historical truth of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy has been finally established beyond rational dispute. The Kennedy assassination is a false mystery. It was conceived by the conspirators to be a false mystery, which was designed to cause interminable debate. The purpose of the protracted debate was to obscure what was quite clearly and plainly a coup d'etat. Simply stated, President Kennedy was assassinated by our U.S. national security state in order to abort his efforts to bring the Cold War to a peaceful conclusion. A critical component of that historical truth is the certainty that without the roles played by Ruth and Michael Payne in President Kennedy's assassination, he could not and would not have been killed in Dallas. It has been firmly established that Kennedy's assassination was conspiratorial. Therefore, rationality requires that one is compelled to the conclusion that Kennedy's killers carefully selected Ruth and Michael Payne to perform the vital conspiratorial tasks to which they were assigned. Without the Paynes having carried out their crucial assignments in the conspiracy, the Dallas assassination of Kennedy simply could not have occurred. Let us briefly summarize some, but certainly not all, of the vital work carried out by the Paynes without which no successful Dallas conspiracy to kill Kennedy could possibly have occurred. The work of the Paynes regarding Oswald was essential for the successful closing of the circle of events that were required to kill Kennedy and to frame Oswald as the Patsy. It was Ruth Payne who had arranged to drive Lee Harvey Oswald's family from New Orleans to Dallas area. It was Ruth Payne who had timely managed Oswald to get a job in the Texas Book Depository building, which turned out to be situated on the presidential motorcade route of November 22nd, 1963. It was Ruth Payne who failed to advise Oswald that a better paying job was available to him than the one to which, which he had arranged to get for him at the Texas Book Depository Building. It was Ruth Payne's garage where the rifle was supposedly stored that allegedly belonged to Oswald and was asserted to have been used by Oswald to kill Kennedy. It was Ruth Payne's garage in which other incriminating evidence against Oswald was reported had been stored. It was the role of Ruth Payne and Michael Payne, both of whom purported to be committed to civil liberties, to join the authorities in designating Oswald as the assassin without his having been offered even a suggestion of due process before he was conveniently killed while in police custody. Notwithstanding the overwhelming weight of the evidence, which speaks to Oswald's innocence, the Paynes even now continue to support the incredible myth that Oswald was Kennedy's lone assassin. Let us examine why it follows. In the absence of the aforementioned roles played by the Paynes in the service of the assassins, the Dallas liquidation of Kennedy and the framing of Oswald could not have happened. Researchers have uncovered a mound of evidence which unquestionably points to U.S. intelligence as the executioners of President Kennedy. Another mound of evidence demonstrates that the Paynes and their families were steeped in involvement in the United States intelligence services. Yet another mound of evidence proved that Oswald was a U.S. intelligence agent. Once one recognizes the Kennedy conspiracy as a conspiracy, one must conclude that the Paynes had been carefully selected by the U.S. intelligence services to fill their important functions. Probability theory, a branch of mathematics, dictates that the invaluable work of the Paynes, which served to incriminate Oswald as the assassin and to frame him, could not have been left by the conspirators to happenstance. One cannot rationally attribute to happenstance the cause of the series of actions of the pains which served to impute guilt to Oswald. Such a conclusion defines that branch of mathematics called probability theory. So, 
The pains were a necessary part of the conspiracy to kill Kennedy and to frame Oswald. Probability theory precludes that the pains had not been selected to play the roles, but had rationally and by happenstance performed them. It also necessarily follows that since the pains had been assigned their roles by the assassins, the pains could serve as beacons showing the way to identify the conspirators who had selected them was to confirm the identity of the forces behind Kennedy's assassination. And I was eager to get to know the pains. In August of 1965, the opportunity for me to meet the pains presented itself. I had the good fortune to come to know and make a friend of Shirley Martin of Hominy, Oklahoma, who was one of the earliest Kennedy assassination critics. It was she who had arranged for Mark Lane to represent Oswald posthumously in Shirley Martin's assassination investigatory pursuits. Shirley had come to know the pains. Shirley had planned in August of 1965 to visit the pains at their Irving, Texas residence. She decided to include me in the visit. In planning the journey, we thought it best that Shirley not advise the pains in advance that I was to be included in the meeting. We scheduled a one-day trip. In the early morning, Shirley and I left on our trip. Shirley was driving us in her car when a local police officer signaled for us to pull over. When she did so, the police officer politely told Shirley, Miss Martin, we see that you're on your way on a trip. Please drive carefully. Shortly after dawn, we had reached Dallas and went directly to Dealey Plaza, where Kennedy had been killed. When we emerged from Shirley's car at Dealey Plaza, a big man, appearing to be in his 50s and wearing sandals, approached me. Upon reaching me, he asked, How is Mark Lane? I offered no, no answer. By pointing broadly to the area around, he asked, uh, Do you know what this is? Dealey Plaza, Dealey Plaza, I answered. He then followed with, No, do you know what it is? I responded, Well, I guess I don't. He followed by answering his own question. This is a WPA project, a socialist project, where a socialist president was killed. The next time you write an article, mention that. This informative man then undertook to explain to me his view of the Holocaust. He related that the Holocaust had been a mere historical accident. He said that Jews just happened to have been closely quartered together in the ghettos in Europe. As a consequence of this intense crowding, they naturally got killed from the carnage of World War II in greater numbers than the rest of the population. It was accidental, he explained. The large man, having informed me about some history, also had indirectly informed me that he knew who I was and why I was in Dealey Plaza. He then slowly and calmly walked away. After Dealey Plaza, Shirley and I then drove to Irving, Texas, the home of Michael and Ruth Payne. Author Thomas Mallon in the book, Mrs. Payne's Garage, wrote admiringly of the Paynes. He wrote in a book about Martin Salandria trip to the Paynes and that, quote, Mrs. Martin apologized to Ruth for lack of any advance notice about Salandria, end of quote. Page 129. So, the pains had not been advised in advance by Shirley Martin of my identity, nor of my planned visit to them. Yet, apparently, saw no, they saw apparently no need to conceal from me that they had received prior information about my visit. At that time, I had achieved no name recognition from my assassination writings in tiny, low-circulation magazines. Therefore, there was little chance that pains on their own could have come to know anything about me. Before my visit with them, they had apparently informed, uh, been informed about my identity. Michael Payne had become aware that I had worked in civil liberties and civil rights. In fact, I had served for many years 
as a volunteer lawyer with the American Civil Liberties Union, immediately after having been introduced by name only by Shirley to the Paines, Michael Payne promptly asked me, uh, why don't you stick to your work in civil liberties and civil rights? This question struck me as curious on two accounts. First, I wondered how he had learned about my work in civil liberties and civil rights. And second, I wondered why my efforts to learn the truth about the Kennedy assassination would be viewed by him as an activity that was not compatible with my work researching the Kennedy assassination. For both of the Paines were ACLU members, like me. Both had attended War Commission secret hearings, which had not been open to the public. They knew that secrecy in such an investigation was contrary to the openness sought by the ACLU. Then why, I wondered, would Michael Payne see my work in the Kennedy assassination research as separate from, rather than complementary with, my civil liberties and civil rights efforts. On the way home from Dallas, upon re-entering the Hominy, Oklahoma area, Shirley Martin was driving well within the speed limit. Nonetheless, a police officer signaled us to pull over and issued a speeding ticket to Shirley. Through this visit to the Paines, I was grimly force-fed certain facts by my, the conspirators. They were informing me of their extensive power of surveillance. Rather than being secretive about their tracking me, they were informing me that they were so powerful that they were willing to have me know that they had instructed the pains on how to toy with me. I was being advised that the pains did not see themselves as having a need to conceal their foreknowledge of me. The killers were informing me that the pains did not see that it was necessary for them to conceal from me their connections with the power that was tracking me. Conspirators were telling me that their operatives, the pains, absolutely and transparently loyal to them. Later, when I was able to reflect and to give meaning to Michael Payne's curious suggestion that my work in civil liberties and civil rights was incompatible with my Kennedy assassination research. It turned out that Michael Payne, when he imparted to me that I had to choose between doing either the assassination or the ACLU work, had been remarkably prescient. For upon my return to Philadelphia, I was phoned by my close friend, Spencer Cox. Spencer was the executive director of the Philadelphia branch of the ACLU. In his phone call, he asked me to come to his office. When I arrived, he suggested that we take a walk together. After walking a few city blocks, Spencer Cox broke an awkward silence and said, uh, Vince, the national office of the ACLU contacted me. Uh, they want you to s stop writing articles about the Kennedy assassination. Without saying anything, Spencer, I removed my wallet from my trousers. I extracted from my wallet the ACLU membership card. Without comment, I handed it to him. By that act, I resigned from my friendship with Spencer and my membership in the ACLU. The resignations were, for me, emotionally wrenching. Spencer Cox had been a dear friend, and I had dedicated much work over so many years to the causes espoused by the ACLU. It pained me to have to depart from what I had viewed as an admirable organization and from a close and endearing friendship. Michael Payne had informed me, although indirectly, that the assassins to which he was transparently closely connected, were quite formidable. They were so powerful that they had prevailed upon the ACLU to seek to discourage me from writing about the Kennedy assassination. The assassins had ironically succeeded getting the American Civil Liberties Union, its reasons for existence is to preserve civil liberties, 
to seek to get me to refrain from exercising my First Amendment right to free speech and writing on the Kennedy assassination. Apparently, Ruth Payne had shared my concern for an open society and for the increasing power of the CIA. On April 20, 1968, she wrote a letter to my friend Jim Garrison. In that letter, she offered to support his efforts to arrive at the truth in the Kennedy assassination. In part, she wrote, quote, I was glad to discover that there are some fundamental ways which I agree with the importance of your pursuit of information regarding a possible conspiracy. Most basic is the conviction that if our form of society is to survive, we must create checks and balances on the bargaining, I'm sorry, burgeoning clandestine wing of our government called the CIA, or close it down. Your charges are so sweeping and major, it would be national folly not to pursue the issue to see where truth lies. If there are ways I can help, I shall be glad. I was struck by your passionate concern for man and by the intense grief you feel over the loss of President Kennedy. I, too, feel that loss acutely. He had taken the measure of the, quote, expert advice, end of quote, of generals and the CIA, and had found it wanting. He was a man prepared to do his own thinking in a framework of the highest regard for man, for life, and for civilization. For myself, I've given up wondering when the sharp sting of my grief over the loss will wane. I have concluded it never shall. And in that, I found you kindred with highest regards, Ruth, end of quote. In this letter to Jim Garrison, Ruth Payne had stated that she had a desire to check the power of the CIA and the generals and to help find the truth of the Kennedy assassination. Yet, Ruth Payne's roles and those of her husband, Michael, were crucial in making the assassination conspiracy in Dallas successful. Their roles were only ma matched in their importance in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy by that played by former Senator Arlen Specter. It was Arlen Specter, the author of the single bullet theory, that was designed to solve the three-bullet ammunition shortage that befell the Warren Commission. It was Arlen Specter's theory which made possible the Warren Commission's myth that Oswald, and Oswald alone, killed President Kennedy with a three-bullet ammunition supply. Senator Specter, like the Paines, persisted for almost 50 years in defending his single bullet theory. Almost immediately after the issues of the Warren Report, I had accused Arlen Specter of having been fraudulent in his analysis of the ballistics evidence of the Warren Commission. Over almost 50 years, I had predicted that the Specter would never waver in his support for his Warren Commission work. Unexpectedly, some four years ago, Senator Specter proved me wrong. Senator Specter phoned me. In his call, he asked me to have lunch with him. I agreed. The following occurred at that luncheon. On January 4th, 2012, I arrived at the Oyster House restaurant in Philadelphia to meet with Arlen Specter. At the lunch, I thanked Specter for arranging for us to meet. I told him that I would relate to him why I viewed his work on the Kennedy assassination as having very likely saved my life. I also confided to him that if I had given his, been given his Warren Commission assignment. And if I had known then what I learned over the years, I would have done what he did. Of course, as a pacifist, peace activist, 
with socialist leanings. I would never have been selected by, uh, for Specter's Warren Commission assignment, which was to cover up the state crime of killing President Kennedy and framing Lee Harvey Oswald for the crime. I related to Specter how the conspirators had given the killing a leftist aura, but that Oswald was not a leftist, but rather was a U.S. intelligence agent. I told him that the Kennedy assassins, by choosing as the patsy a supposed defector of the Soviet Union and a fair play for Cuba member, had pointed an accusatory finger at the Soviet Union and Cuba as being complicit in the Kennedy assassination. I said that the Warren Commission had chosen to turn away from the option of a leftist assassination of Kennedy to a lone assassin myth. I told Spectre that over the years, I'd come to understand that my view of the assassination as a coup could not be accepted by the U.S. public. It was true that the public opinion polls, except for those taken immediately following the Warren Commission's issuance, indicated that the majority of the American people believed that an undefined conspiracy had killed Kennedy. I told Spectre that over the years, I had come to acknowledge that if the Warren Commission's Oswald myth had not quieted the U.S. public, but had unraveled shortly after the assassination, the domestic and possibly international chaos would have very likely ensued. I explained that the alternative to the Oswald lone assassin myth was written large as a pro-Soviet and Castro killing. I told Spectre that if the leftist killing of Kennedy had been adopted by the War Commission, Warren Commission, I believe that the consequences would have been dire. In such a case of a reported leftist killing of Kennedy, the U.S. military would have been free to consider the killing an act of war. The next president would have been considered a unitary president, possessing dictatorial powers. Spectre then asked me what I thought the reason was for the assassination. In reply, I asked him whether he had read the correspondence between President Kennedy and Premier Nikita Khrushchev. He said he had not. I explained that my reading of the correspondence had convinced me that Kennedy and Khrushchev had grown fond of one another and were seeking to end the Cold War. I told Speck that I felt that the two leaders sought to change the Cold War into a peaceful competition on an economic rather than a military basis. They were going to test peacefully the relative merits of a free market system and a command economy model. I told them that I saw the U.S. military and intelligence services and their civilian allies as having been deeply opposed to ending the Cold War. I also related to Spectre, there was a bitter conflict between Kennedy and our military on the issue of escalation in Vietnam. I told Spectre that I felt Kennedy was seeking to withdraw our military advisors from Vietnam, and this policy was unacceptable to our Joint Chiefs of Staff who wanted a U.S. military victory there. I explained that the day after Kennedy's assassination, I had met with my then brother-in-law, Harold Feldman. We decided that if Oswald was the killer, and if the U.S. government was innocent of any complicity in the killing, Oswald would live through the weekend. If Oswald was the assassin, he would be given a fair and public trial, which would serve the purpose of clearing the U.S. government from suspicion of complicity in the killing. But if Oswald was killed over the weekend, then we would know that the assassination was the result of a high-level U.S. government plot. For only a guilty government would have uh, Oswald killed while in police custody in order to silence him. Oswald had already identified himself to the Dallas police as the Patsy. Spectre made reference to a meeting in 1964. That meeting occurred after Spectre had completed his work for the Warren Commission. He had met, we met when he was being honored 
by the Philadelphia Bar Association for his uh, wine commission work. He asked me what I remembered about the event. I said that I attended the meeting with my copy of the Warren Report. After his address, I directed some questions to him regarding his conclusions about the shots, trajectories, and wounds of the assassination. His answers to my questions were considerably less than dispositive of the problems I had raised. At the conclusion of the meeting, some of my legal colleagues gathered around me and asked me to write an article on the subject. I did so and sent the article to the Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association, Theodore Vores. I requested that he have it published. He arranged for its publication in the Legal Intelligencer, the oldest legal journal in the nation. In the article, I concluded that Spector's work was fraudulent and the U.S. government's Warren Commission evidence proved that there was a conspiracy. Spector recalled that our, in our conversation in City Hall, I accused him of corruption. He said that he had asked me at that time whether they would change the charge to incompetency. I had refused, and I told him that I could not have changed the charge to incompetency because I knew then from his public records, as I knew in our meeting at the luncheon, that he was not incompetent. My charge of fraud made at the meeting was reiterated in the Legal Intelligence article in which I described the Warren Commission's work as speculation conforming to none of the evidence. In the article, I had written that the Warren Commission deserved to have not the slightest credibility. I wrote that the Warren Commission was incredible because it had committed errors of logic and its findings were contrary to laws of physics and especially the Newtonian laws of motion. Spectre asked me where I thought the Warren Commission had been a setup. I answered, probably not all of the commissioners knew that it was a setup, but that Alan Dulles and Earl Warren knew. I also told him I thought that McGeorge Bundy was privy to the plot. The Warren Report largely succeeded during the critical times, immediately following the assassination, in quieting the public's concerns. As it developed, my work criticizing the Warren Commission was ineffective in exciting any material opposition to the Warren Commission's findings. So I told Spectre that the effectiveness of his work and the ineffectiveness of my own caused my life to be spared. Arlen Spectre has done that which the pains had failed to do, turn away from asserting the falsehoods regarding the purposeful and dark roles that their lies had performed in the service of the national security state's killing of President Kennedy. In the recent book of historical significance entitled The Devil's Chessboard, author David Talbot spells out how Alan Dulles had both the motive to kill and coordinated the conspiracy which killed Kennedy. Alan Dulles was a very active member of the Warren Commission and was a close friend of Michael Payne's mother, Ruth Forbes Payne. Both Ruth and Michael Payne's families are deeply enmeshed in CIA activity. As we have set forth, there is no rational way that the Paynes could hope to explicate, explicate their roles in the Kennedy assassination as the innocent results of an accidental occurrence of a series of inexplicable and weird coincidences. The mathematics of probability theory forecloses that a series of coincidences serve as fig leaves to conceal effectively their guilt by enabling the conspirators to assassinate President Kennedy. The truth is plain with great care, they were chosen by Alan Dulles to do their work that made possible Kennedy's assassination in Dulles. Intelligence agents require that operatives in carrying out their covert functions know only what they need to know. Therefore, it's quite clear that the Paines had no reason or need to know, and therefore, had received no for 
warning of the planned assassination of Kennedy. They had no reason to believe that they were being selected by Alan Dulles to serve critical roles in falsely implicating Oswald in an assassination in which he was to be the patsy. The information to which they were made privy about the nature of their assignments, which information was greatly constricted, was based on need-to-know limitations. The information which had they had prior to the assassination was unquestionably sketchy and uninformative. They were in a very real sense victimized by being unknowingly and critically positioned so that they have been recorded in history as having paid, played key roles in effectuating the conspiracy which killed President Kennedy. They were victimized by their employers, the National Security State, in its falsification of the historical questions in order to obscure how and why it assassinated Kennedy. I respectfully direct my concluding remarks to Ruth and Michael Payne. I address them as a fellow human being who understands and empathizes with them for the evil roles they were unknowingly designated to serve on behalf of the criminality of our national security state. They were victimized by being placed in positions which resulted in enormous harm to our republic and to global peace. As a consequence of the Kennedy assassination, the national security state which killed Kennedy is now in substantial control of both our military budget and our foreign policy. Our war for a budget supports perpetual war and causes the consequent depletion of our social welfare and grossly increases the suffering incurred by those in the lower economic brackets. Our efforts to maintain our military global hegemony excites increasing levels of retaliatory terroristic activity. The terroristic activity is further exacerbated by the covert actions of our intelligence services, which have little or no respect for national boundaries and sovereignty. Our perpetual wars take a horrible toll on the lives of innocent civilians. The militarism that grew out of the Kennedy assassination is making a future, more peaceful nation and world impossible. Ruth and Michael Payne, I view, as being named to perform intelligence functions related to Oswald that they had no reason to understand were essential to Kennedy's assassination. But, after many years, their guilt in continuing to misrepresent the truth of how they were used to implement the assassination of Dallas is now fully known to them. They now know that it was not coincidence but Alan Dulles, who carefully selected them for their assignments. The task that they performed at the behest of Alan Dulles enabled the assassins to kill Kennedy in Dallas. I respectfully urge Ruth and Michael Payne to separate themselves now from their long allegiance to the work of Alan Dulles and the powerful military and intelligence dark forces which assassinated Kennedy. They ask the pains to refuse future support for the first false history of the Kennedy assassination, which serves the interests of our war first state. Instead, I implore them to embrace the historical truth and to use it to honor President Kennedy for his brave turn towards peace, which led to his martyrdom. I urge the pains to join with those who espoused the truth of Kennedy's death, which was so assiduously sought by Jim Garrison. I ask the Paines to enlist themselves in helping to publicize the remarkable research of James Douglas and David Talbot that shows how and why the National Security State killed Kennedy. By so doing, so doing, they will help our society point the way to the hard work 
of restoring our republic, which was shot away by the terrible fusillade in Dilly Plaza. I respectfully implore them to take Arlen Specter as a model. I beseech them to abandon their long service to a war for a state. To turn towards peace and historical truth, would their turn would, would be your only path to redemption. If the pains had spoken the truth in 1963, most probably there would have been catastrophic consequences. So in 1963, pain truth-telling, in the words of Sophocles, would have caused terrible ruin. But Senator Arlen Specter, at the luncheon with me, demonstrated the times have changed. He ceased telling and defending the lies of the Warren Commission. No terrible ruin resulted from his turn away from and towards truth. I would hope that others will join me in seeing him as a consequence of his turn towards truth, as entitled to pardon for his fraudulent role in the service of the Warren Commission. I submit that no terrible ruin will result from the pains ceasing telling their lies about how they came to play the roles which were so critical in the closing of the circle which made the Dallas assassination of President Kennedy occur. Rather than terrible ruin, their commitment to historical truth now is likely to cause social good. Historical truth is the pole star which guides humankind when we grope for direction to help guide us through the thick morass of current crises. Without historical truth, we deny the guidance and wisdom required to solve the afflictions which now threaten the very existence of the family of man. If the pains contribute to our society's arriving at the historical truth of the Kennedy assassination, they will help to allow themselves to achieve redemption and pardon. On May 1, 1962, Kennedy posed a question to some Quakers who visited him at the White House. He asked, you believe in redemption, don't you? I hope that the Paines believe in redemption and will, through telling the truth about their assassination roles, turn away from the militarists and towards a more peaceful world, which Kennedy was seeking when he was martyred.